Welcome back to the Group Therapy Counseling Series. This is Section 2. In this section, we're going to provide details about the group therapy models used in substance abuse and co-occurring disorders treatment. We'll explain the stages of change, describe the five group therapy models used in substance abuse treatment, discuss the three specialized group therapy models used in substance abuse treatment. So, pre-contemplation, contemplation, preparation, action, maintenance, and possibly recurrence. Most of us have heard these phrases before. These are the five or six, I guess in this case, stages of change. Not everybody believes that recurrence has to be in the stages of change. We'll talk about that in a second. They're really named very literally. Pre-contemplation, I'm not even contemplating the fact that I've got a problem. Nobody can tell me I've got a problem, so go away. Contemplation, I'm starting to think that, yeah, I might drink a little bit more than other people, or I might have a little bit of a problem. Might do it a little bit more, but... I can make excuses for it. So I'm starting to contemplate the fact that I might need to make a change, but I'm not really ready to admit that it's a problem yet. In preparation, I've decided, yeah, it might be a problem. So I'm preparing to start taking steps to make changes. I'm preparing for action. That means I'm kind of getting my ducks in a row. I'm learning about different treatment models. I'm trying to figure out what I really need. Can I kick it by just going to 12-step meetings? Can I do a self-help book and be peachy neat and keen? Or do I have to see a therapist? What needs to happen? In the action phase, I've decided what I'm going to do. And I take action so I can start changing. Once a person has made some strides, has made some changes, anytime you make a change, whether it's a New Year's resolution or substance abuse treatment, You make that change, then you've got to maintain it. And maintenance really goes from the end of when you kind of stop making that change or when you reach your goal throughout the rest of your life or until you decide to change again. Maintenance is fine-tuning your relapse prevention plan. And this is for mental health issues as well as substance abuse. The thing with maintenance is that life is not predictable. Life is not the same day in and day out. There are going to be hiccups. There are going to be strange events that happen. So in the maintenance phase, we have to take the new skills and tools we have and the new support systems, etc., and figure out how to make those work when things go a little bit wonky in life. So let's talk about recurrence for a minute. I personally believe, and this is my personal opinion, that everybody will have a little bit of recurrence. We're all going to have little slips when our thinking starts becoming negative again. We go back to that stinking thinking, those cognitive distortions. We start feeling depressed. We start neglecting our health. We start neglecting our relationships. Does that mean we've picked up again? Does that mean that we've relapsed? No. A recurrence is when those relapse warning signs start showing up. We can stop a relapse in its tracks by paying attention to relapse warning signs. I personally do not believe that you have to go through a full-blown relapse at least once in order to recover. I think people can learn how to be cognizant of what's going on with them emotionally, mentally, physically, spiritually, socially, and environmentally in order to keep themselves safe and make changes when things start to go awry. So there are basically five models of group therapy, psychoeducational, skills development, cognitive behavioral or problem-solving groups, support groups, and interpersonal process groups. Then there are a couple of specialty groups that we'll talk about as well. There are a lot of variables when we're talking about groups. The group leader or leader focus is one of the first things. 
In psychoeducational groups, we're going to focus on communicating information, education. We're providing the foundation knowledge for people from which they can build skills and tools and relationships. Some groups, like your psychoeducational groups, are going to have a very specific group agenda. Cognitive behavioral groups are very similar. They have a very specific agenda. Some of your other groups, like your expressive groups, or your interpersonal groups, will be a little less structured and rigid. The, heter uh, the difference of group members, I can never say those two words anyway. Um, <laughs> when you have groups that are composed of, for example, all men between the ages of 25 and 45 that are roughly of the same socioeconomic background, ethnicity, and religion. That's a relatively homogenous group. So that will affect how that group functions a little bit more than if you had a co-educational group that had people from multiple ethnicities, multiple socioeconomic statuses, multiple different diagnoses and disorders. Open-ended or determinate duration of treatment also will affect how the group goes. An open-ended group is going to probably cover something a little bit different every single week. We may go back and review some skills that are especially salient, but there's not a structure like going through a textbook. A determinate duration of treatment, for example, an IOP program that is 90 days, will have very specific skills and tasks that need to be accomplished within the group within that time period. The leader activity will also vary between different types of groups. Psychoeducational groups, typically the leader is very, very active. Support groups and interpersonal groups, typically the leader is much less active and directive, and it's more on the clients and the participants to keep the group going and to facilitate discussion. The duration of treatment and the length of each session also differs. Now, part of this is the type of the group, but part of this is also what's going on with your members. When I was in a residential setting, we had a lot of people who would come in who just got out of detox. Making them sit through a 90-minute group, have a 15-minute break, and then sit through an another 90-minute group would have been torture, and it would have been pointless because they wouldn't have gotten anything out of it. So paying attention to what your clients can handle. If you have a group of people who are doing relatively well, they're functioning, they're in IOP or something, then a 60 to 90-minute group is perfectly reasonable with some breaks in there to get up and stretch your legs. If you've got people who are either in early recovery, are starting new medications, are um, have some cognitive impairments, something like that, then you may need to break it down so the groups are 30 minutes. If you're dealing with a population that has severe and persistent mental illness, you will definitely want to keep your groups down to about 30 minutes. You may have more groups, but they're going to be shorter. The arrangement of the room. A psychoeducational group can be in more of a classroom situation. A, an expressive group may have people sitting in an audience and have a stage. There are a lot of different ways to arrange a room. I find personally with psychoeducational groups and skills development groups, it's still better to have a circle or a semicircle so people can see one another and feed off one another's nonverbals. When you have people stacked like in a classroom, you tend to have people feel like they're not being seen, so they start drifting. And the characteristics of the individuals. We've already talked about this some. However, we really need to focus on the level of trauma exposure these people have had. We need to focus on their cognitive capacities at that present time. That doesn't mean they are permanently cognitively impaired. However, if you're doing a group in detox or in early recovery where people are getting stabilized on their meds, they may have not slept well for the past six months, 
we need to pay attention to that. If you're dealing with people who have English as a second language in your group, it may not be everybody in the group, but if there are some people in the group, you need to pay attention to that. Later in this presentation, we're going to talk about some of the best practices for adult learning theory. And this will really speak to the characteristics of individuals and learning styles. Psychoeducational groups are probably one of my favorite. They assist individuals in every stage of change, which is a little different than what the book says. The book says in pre-contemplation, and yes, it's awesome in pre-contemplation because people are not thinking about making a change yet, so we need to educate them. But even when we get to action, we need to provide education to people who want to change about whatever it is they want to change and how to change it. Psychoeducational groups help clients learn about their disorders, their issues, their strengths, and their weaknesses. We do inventories. I come from a strengths-based perspective. Go figure. So we're going to do an inventory of how do you deal with these different situations, maybe 10 or 15 situations on the board, and we have people share how they would cope with each one of them. And then we'll talk about how that's a good way of coping or how that's not the best way of coping, but we also will look at how that's a creative adaptation that they learned in order to survive a situation they didn't know how to cope with. I want clients to walk out of the room feeling like they've done the best they could to survive until now. Clients can learn about treatment options. They can learn about medications that are available. They can learn about cognitive behavioral therapy or EMDR or any variety of different treatments that are available for certain issues. And they can learn about other resources such as self-help groups, um, places where they can go for vocational assistance, etc. Psychoeducational groups are also awesome for providing family members with an understanding of the person in recovery and the issues or the disorders themselves. I tend to stay away from the identified patient model. I think we may have someone who's the identified patient, the addict, or the person with depression, whatever you want to say. However, there's a whole system that has been supporting that dysfunction for a long time. So we need to help people understand what the symptoms are, what function the symptoms serve, and how to fix it. Psychoeducational groups educate about a disorder or teach a skill or a tool or both. For example, you may have a psychoeducational group about insomnia. So we'll talk about what causes an insomnia, what may go on with a lot of people, their minds racing when they're trying to get to sleep at night. So how do you deal with that? One way is to keep a pen and paper by your bed so you can write down what's going through your mind because if you don't write it down and get it out, it's going to keep flip-flopping around in there, and you're not going to sleep well. So we've learned about insomnia, and we've learned a skill or tool in 45 seconds. We want to work to engage clients in the discussion. What do you do? How do you handle this? Because you know what? You probably have solutions to it that I haven't even thought of. If they're not the best solutions, we can look at what we can pull from that, because if you've used them, repeatedly, that tells me that they've worked to some extent. It may not be the best solution, but it was a solution. So what is it that we can draw from that and build upon? Psychoed groups prompt clients to relate what they learn to their own issues, their disorders, their goals, their challenges, and successes. So we can take these skills and tools and we can say, okay, how can you apply that to when you start feeling depressed? How can you apply that to help you achieve your goal of getting your kids back? How can you apply that to helping you deal with this boss that just drives you absolutely bonkers? How can you apply that to continue your success in recovery, in your relationships, etc.? Everything comes back to why does the patient care and how can they apply it? 
Psycho-ed groups are highly structured and often follow a manual or curriculum. Part of this is because oftentimes the people facilitating these groups are not licensed clinicians. However, I said in the last presentation, I love structure. So I like to follow a manualized curriculum so I know I'm teaching everybody basically the same thing. I teach, well, the group starts, we do a check-in, a review of the assignment from the previous week. I teach for 10 to 15 minutes, and then they apply what they've learned to situations in their past, one, two, three situations, depending on how big the group is, how much time we have. And then I will give them hypothetical situations and say, okay, now I want you to practice. What if this happened? Or we'll role play. Role play can sometimes be fun if you have a group that's willing to get up there and kind of ham it up a little bit. Group leaders for psychoeducational groups need to understand basic group processes. And the forming, norming, storming, all that stuff. They need to understand interpersonal relationship dynamics, transference, countertransference, and just basic inability to effectively communicate. Group leaders also need to understand certain disorders and how they may impact interpersonal relationships, especially um, people who have autism spectrum disorders, people who have um, attention deficit disorder, or cognitive impairments. All three of those categories may impact how people interact in their relationships. So the therapist needs to not only understand that, but help everybody in the group understand how a conversation is supposed to flow, what relationships are supposed to look like. And then they can work with individuals in individual counseling on particular issues they may have because of unique diagnoses. They need to have basic teaching skills. And we're going to talk about this in the next slide because I think it's so vitally important. And basic counseling skills. If you can't provide unconditional positive regard, if you can't reflectively listen, if you can't look around at your group and pick up on nonverbals, then you're going to have a problem. Basic counseling skills. You don't need to be Carl Rogers. You just need to be able to work a room. Basic teaching skills. Have I said that enough? Yeah. Okay. There are some components of learning. Three main components. Acquisition, how you get the information. Conceptualization, how you turn it into something that's meaningful. And caring. Why do I care? So let's talk about red lights. Okay. Red lights have no innate meaning to them. So you're driving along. And, you know, you're a little kid, you're sitting in a car seat, whatever. You see a red light. So you're seeing that and you're seeing what your parent does. So visually, you're picking up on what's going on. That's how you acquire the information. Red light leads to this action. This causes this. Now, conceptualization, when you're a little kid, you're like, eh, I don't really know what that means. Eventually, you start figuring out as you get older that the green light means go, the yellow light means slow, and the red light means stop. But until you start conceptualizing that, you don't understand what it means. Conceptualizing means relating it to something that we're at least vaguely familiar with. If somebody were to start talking to me about nuclear fission, I'd be looking at them drooling on myself because I have no way to conceptualize any of that. Unless they start making analogies, unless they get out some tinker toys and go, okay, this is an atom. This is how it breaks apart and goes boom. And I'm like, okay, I know about going boom. Conceptualization, and I'm kind of making light of the idea, but conceptualization is really where we drive it home so people have that aha mo moment. But once they have the aha moment, they have to care enough to put it into long-term memory. Why does this matter to me? Why do I need to make room in my mental memory banks for this information? 
So let's go back up to acquisition real quick. We talked about the stoplight. You get that visually through seeing. The more senses people use when they learn about something, the stronger the memory connections will be. So if they can see it, they can hear it, they can discuss it, and they can practice it, they're going to have the best chance of learning and retaining that information. When you think about math, you know, think about grade school. Your teacher showed you how to do it. She talked you through it. Then you practiced it. If you didn't quite get it, then you talked out what happened, and then you practiced it some more. Eventually, hopefully, you picked up the skills. Okay, so we need to provide information to our clients in a way that helps them acquire it, get it in their head. Now, there's a little other caveat here, and that's global and sequential. And I want you to think for a second, if you are the type of person who reads the dust jacket first, reads the IMDb summary of the movie before you go, or has to use the picture on the box to make the puzzle. If you're one of those people, like I am, you're a global learner. When I learn something, I need the big envelope first. I need to have a general idea of where we're going with something. And then I can start putting all the pieces in. But until I have that general idea, it's really hard for me to engage. So when we're doing groups, you want to start out with a summary of, today we're going to learn about this, and this is why it's important to you, or this is why it could help you in your recovery process. Sequential learners don't need that envelope. The envelope doesn't hurt them, but they don't need it. They're the type of people who dump out the puzzle on the table, put the box away, and just start flipping over pieces and trying to find something that fits. I just, it makes me absolutely batty to even think about doing that. <laughs> so obviously I'm not a sequential learner. You want to make sure you have the building blocks or the puzzle pieces available to people. So ideally in a group, you're going to start out with an introduction and a summary. You're going to provide them a handout that goes over in general what you're going to go over plus the basic points. If you're thinking outline, you want the main idea and the level two, level one main idea and the level two subtopics. You don't need to get all the way down into the weeds. Just kind of give them the highlights. Let them hold on to that. Then you want to talk about it, have them apply it, have them discuss it. You can even have them teach it. If, you, if they don't want to do role plays, you can break people out and either give them a scenario and say, okay, how would you help John solve this problem? Or you can have them teach, or you can have them role play, or you can have them write it out on a worksheet. Some people are not going to be comfortable getting up in front of groups. They need to understand before they walk out of there why that piece of information is helpful to them. I also end group by summarizing what we learned, why it's helpful, and then I go around and have everyone identify one thing that they got out of group. And it may not be the big point. Actually, I encourage them to say something besides whatever the big point is. Um, and if it is the big point, I want to know how they're planning on using that over the next week. Psychoed techniques foster an environment that supports participation. We're brainstorming. It can be fun. It encourages participants to take responsibility for their learning. I can't help somebody with a question if they don't ask the question. So I want to encourage them to be courageous enough to ask that question, which means for some, taking breaks every 15 to 20 minutes in group or allowing opportunities for people to come up and talk to you individually because they may not want to put it all out there for the whole group. Use a variety of learning methods that require sensory experiences, hearing, seeing, practicing, talking about. Psychoeducational techniques are also mindful of cognitive impairments. If people are having difficulty with short-term memory, we're not going to do a lot of stuff that requires short-term memory. 
Now you go from psychoeducational groups to skills development. They have the foundational knowledge. Now it's time to move to practicing it and using those skills and getting them to where they are sort of second nature. Think about the first time you started uh, practicing with clients. You had certain skills that you used. You go to a conference and you learn a fabulous new skill like motivational interviewing. And you walk out of there and you're excited and you're going to use it with every single client from here on out. The next week, you don't use it with a single client because it's not your go-to activity. Skills development groups help people practice things enough So it does become their go-to activity. Skills development groups assume clients lack the needed skills to do whatever it is, to effectively communicate, to deal with life on life's terms, to deal with their depression. In the example I gave of going to a conference, it assumes that we, as professionals, lack the needed skills to do motivational interviewing. And if you have never been trained in it, then you probably do lack those skills. It's not an insult. It's just saying there are other skills and tools you may not have. Skills development groups allow people to practice skills. So when I do clinical supervision, we will learn a new skill or tool, and I will have people apply that to one of their clients, and we'll talk about how that, what that might have looked like. Or I'll pick out a section of a videotape, and I'll say, okay, you used your go-to intervention. What would happen if you used this intervention over here? Let's role play it and see how it might have gone differently. Skills development groups may you focus on skills directly related to recovery, like refusal skills, and um, going to meetings, relapse prevention. But they also may focus on skills necessary to thrive in general, like vocational skills, communication skills, self-esteem. Pretty much nothing's off the table. If we go from a co-occurring perspective, most any skill that anyone has to deal with life on life's terms is fair game for a skills development group. Skills development groups have a limited number of sessions and a limited number of participants. We don't want to have 30 people in a room. We want to make sure everybody gets a chance to practice. So 8 to 10 people in a group. 8 to 10 sessions. You don't want to keep practicing the ABCs over and over again for 14 weeks. People would quit coming. 8 to 10 sessions to learn a skill or tool. Skills development groups strengthen behavioral and cognitive resources by helping people build on the strengths that they already have and focus on developing an information base on which decisions can be made and actions taken. So something happens, people can look in their memory banks and go, okay, this is how I used to react. This is the consequence. This is what I want the consequence to be. So what tools and skills do I have in my repertoire now that I can use to get the consequence I want? Skills development group leaders need basic group therapy knowledge and skills. The knowledge and ability to demonstrate the skills that the clients are trying to develop. If you don't have the skills, you can't teach the skills. If I don't know geometry, I can't teach geometry. They're aware of the different ways people approach issues and problems. My daughter is very good at math, but the way she solves problems, like simple addition, subtraction, multiplication, basic stuff, is not the way I would have solved it. Does she get the right answer? Yes. Am I going to tell her to do it my way? Because it's my way? No. What she's doing makes sense to her, and it works for her, and it's effective. So we need to be aware that there are multiple ways to deal with a situation and encourage people to figure out what works for them. And it uses a strengths-based creative adaptations approach. You've dealt with these situations before. What have you done that worked? 
one of the things we use in um, brief therapy is to look for exceptions. In the past, when you've tried to quit smoking, tell me about a time that you were able to quit. And if they shake their head and go, I've never been able to, say, well, did you smoke last night between the hours of 11 p.m. and 6 a.m.? They'll be like, no, I was sleeping. Well, you didn't smoke. So we know that when you're sleeping, you're not going to smoke. Now, you can't sleep 24-7. So that is not a useful tool. But that's one exception. What are some other times that you're doing things that you are not smoking? Maybe you are on the bus going to work. Maybe you are eating. Maybe you are doing something with your children. Maybe you're at the library. There's a lot of different things that people do where they can't smoke because it's against the law or they don't want to smoke or whatever the case may be. Those are all exceptions. So these are things they can do more often in order to help them get through the period where they're craving smoking. We have to deal with the cravings and the habits and all that stuff too. But what we want to do is help them identify Things that they already do or things that have already worked, even if it was just for an hour or for a day, and build upon that. These techniques vary depending on the skills being taught. So you may have a group that's teaching a very simple concept, like identifying exceptions. I'll spend a group and a half on that. One group teaching it and part of the next group reviewing it and making sure everybody's got it. That's enough. Now, if you're teaching something like the ABCs, which also have the Ds and Es, (laughs) that can go into more of a two or three session application. I find it usually takes people at least one whole session just to wrap their head around the concept of the automatic beliefs. So some of these skills may take multiple groups. Some you may be able to do in one group. These groups also hold positive expectations for change. We want to be cheerleaders. Just like if you were teaching somebody how to do math or how to do a cartwheel, you would hold a positive expectation that they could get the hang of it. However, people are going to learn it at different rates. Some people are going to pick it up really easy. Some people, we may have to present it two or three different ways. The positive expectation is, I know you can do it. We just need to figure out how to help you do it. And techniques will also depend on the nature of the group, the topic, and the approach of the group leader. I tend to be mainly cognitive behavioral and with a little bit of mindfulness and uh, um, dialectical behavior therapy kind of thrown in there. Obviously, my techniques are going to be much more Um, CBT practical hands-on than someone else who may focus on more interpersonal psychodynamic humanistic approach. We're still teaching the skills. We may teach them a slightly different way or we may teach different skills because like I said there's more than one way to solve a problem. Cognitive behavioral groups, my favorite. Conceptualize, I know I said psychoed were my favorite, but CBT are too. <laughs> I can have multiple favorites. We want to conceptualize dependence as a learned behavior that is subject to modifications through various interventions. What in the world does that mean? We want people to realize that their use, their addiction, their behavior, their dysfunctional behaviors are learned. And everything we do has a benefit, and the benefit outweighs the cost. So we need to look at what was the benefit of how you reacted here. And how can we achieve that same benefit in a healthier, more productive way? When you get to motivational interviewing and even some of the brief therapy texts, you will talk about decisional balance exercises. I'm not going to go into those here, but you can Google them or you can um, look them up in your textbook. Decisional balance exercises. CBT groups work to change learned behavior by changing thinking patterns, beliefs, and perceptions. Changing those automatic thoughts and those irrational beliefs 
go a long way toward helping people stop making themselves miserable. Once they realize the connection between their thought patterns and their reactions, they have this aha moment and they realize that they have control over their reactions. CBT groups do include psychological elements such as thoughts, beliefs, decisions, opinions, and assumptions. We talk about where where people got their values. Who says that everybody must love you all of the time? Where did you get that? What do you think about that? And how does that premise contribute to your happiness or your unhappiness? So we do want to talk about the elements that are helping people to get happier and also the ones that are keeping them stuck. CBT groups develop social networks that support abstinence so that the person with dependence becomes aware of behaviors that may lead to relapse and develops strategies to continue in recovery. With cognitive behavioral therapy, people will start practicing in group, but then when they see each other in meetings, they can say, you know, I think, you know, that habit you have of thinking that everybody has to like you all the time, it's biting you in the butt right now. And the person can have an aha moment or not, but the social networks start talking the same language, these irrational automatic thoughts, and helps draw people's awareness to the things that are happening seemingly unconsciously that are keeping them miserable. CBT groups provide a structured environment within which members can examine the behaviors, thoughts, and beliefs that lead to maladaptive behavior. Sometimes they follow a treatment manual that provides protocols for intervention techniques. Other times we have a trained facilitator who has a strong background in cognitive behavioral and dialectical behavior therapy, who has a toolbox. And we start talking about issues, and you will learn different tools from the toolbox. CBT groups emphasize structure, goal orientation, and a focus on the immediate problems. We can't change the past. We can't predict the future. All we can deal with is how you're reacting to what's going on right now, And how you can act or react differently in order to facilitate your recovery. CBT groups use educational devices such as worksheets and journals, role plays and videos. And encompass a variety of approaches that focus on changing cognition and the behavior that occurs because of the way we think. People who have positive, happy thoughts, optimistic people tend to be happier. Negative, pessimistic people tend to be grumpier. Go figure. CBT group leaders have a solid grounding in the theory of CBT, are actively engaged in the group, and have a consistently directive orientation. We're not going to go off on some little path and explore the squirrel that happened to show up in front of the window. We are going to stay on task. We allow group members to use the power of the group to develop their own capabilities. Group members can identify potential automatic beliefs. One of the things I do is I have somebody share a situation that causes them distress. We put up the situation. That's the activating event. We put up the distress. That's the consequence. And then everybody shares, because most people have had similar situations, Everybody starts sharing what their automatic beliefs are. So we get a sort of a group think that helps people identify automatic beliefs that they may not have even thought of. And then we can start addressing each one of those beliefs and identifying them as rational or irrational and productive or unproductive. CBT group leaders recognize, respect, and work with resistance instead of simply confronting it. Everything we do has a benefit, and the reward is greater for that than the alternative. So if somebody is continuing to hold fast to a certain belief system, 
There's a reason for it. People typically aren't going to bang their heads in the wall just to spite you. They're doing it because it feels so good when they stop. They're doing it because there's a reason. So as therapists, instead of looking at them as oppositional and resistant, we need to look at what's going on and say, what need is this behavior meeting for them that I have not provided an alternative for? CBT techniques teach group members about self-destructive behavior and thinking that lead to maladaptive behavior. It focuses on problem solving and short and long-term goal setting, identifying observable, measurable, time-limited goals, and helps clients monitor feelings and behavior, particularly those associated with substance abuse and emotional distress, anxiety, depression, PTSD, so they can intervene early. They can change anything that is changeable. Let's move on to support groups. Support groups are useful for apprehensive clients who are looking for a safe environment. They bolster members' efforts to develop and strengthen their ability to manage thinking and emotions and interpersonal skills. They address pragmatic concerns and it can improve members' self-esteem and self-confidence. Walking into a support group, you're walking into a group. Again, this particular type is facilitated. But you're walking into a group of people who are like you. So all of a sudden, that isolation goes away. And you can start feeling a little more comfortable. You can start seeing that there are other worthwhile people out there that have the same issues as you do. It gives members a chance to start dipping their toe into the treatment milieu. A lot of us, if you weren't raised in a situation where you, you know, maybe your parent was a psychologist or you went to counseling yourself, it's scary because people don't know what to expect. All they know is what they've seen on TV from one flew over the cuckoo's nest to, you know, your modern miniseries. So what does treatment look like? What are people going to make me do? Support groups provide a place for people to make friends, develop some allies, and get encouragement to take that next step or continue to take the right steps. They're often open-ended with changing populations of members. People come, people go. It's not a beginning and an end. It's not an eight-week, ten-week. It's ongoing. They encourage discussion about members' current situations and recent problems. Remember I said that we use support group format for our aftercare groups because it encouraged people to come back and discuss what's going on with them, what's good, and what's going on with them that they might want some feedback about. It also provides peer feedback and requires members to be accountable to one another. Accountability goes along with that whole structure and discipline thing in the recovery process. Support group leaders need a solid grounding in how groups evolve and how people interact and change in groups. They need to have a theoretical framework that supports group development, member goals, interactions, and the specific interventions. When I work with supervisees, who do group, and I say, what is your group theory? And they say, eclectic psychodynamic. I say, well, what does that mean? And I want them to tell me exactly what they mean by that. If they've got somebody who is suicidal, what are they going to do? If they've got a whole group of people who are clinically depressed, trauma survivors, how is that group going to differ from a group of people in pre-contemplation with addictive addiction issues. Support group leadership, leadership need to build connections among members and emphasize what they have in common. Common coping skills, commonalities, like maybe you're both parents, maybe common jobs, maybe common thought systems. We want to help people learn how to build connections and focus on commonalities and strengths while still appreciating differences. 
Support groups are usually less directive than for other groups and provide a positive reinforcement, model appropriate interactions, respect boundaries, and foster open communication. Support groups are where people really learn how to develop effective relationships. Setting boundaries is huge. Respecting boundaries is huger. (laughs) I don't think that's a word, but most clients, especially in substance abuse and co-occurring disorders treatment, have difficulty recognizing their own boundaries and respecting others. Techniques used in support groups really vary with group goals, member needs, and what the facilitator feels comfortable handling. They include facilitating discussion among members, maintaining appropriate group boundaries, helping the group work through obstacles and conflicts, and providing acceptance of and regard for members. Remember I said we need to encourage people to focus on commonalities while also respecting differences. Not everybody is going to believe that abstinence is necessary. Not everybody is going to believe or accept that methadone is a treatment for opiate opiate addiction. So there are certain issues that may come up in your group and you need to know how to handle them. Techniques ensure that interpersonal struggles among group members don't hinder group development. So if you have two people in your group and we'll assume that they are just friends and it hasn't developed into some dysfunctional romantic relationship, but they're in a fight. We don't want that coming in and dominating the support group. They may need to have a session with a therapist, but we do want to maybe talk about some skills and tools to help people deal with interpersonal struggles. Interpersonal process groups recognize that conflicting forces in the mind, some of which may be out of one's awareness, determines a person's behavior, whether healthy or unhealthy. So these interpersonal process groups recognize that things like transference actually occur. They give credence to the fact that, you know, sometimes you see somebody and your spidey senses just go off and you don't know why. It helps people understand that that does happen and how to deal with it. They also address developmental influences starting in early childhood and environmental influences to which people are particularly vulnerable because of their genetic and other biological characteristics. Social learning theory, ecological theory. What did people learn about the goodness of individuals? What did people learn about coping? What did people learn from their peer groups, from their parents, from their community about how to deal with life on life's terms? What do we need to maybe take a look at again? These groups delve into major developmental issues, searching for patterns that contribute to addiction or interfere with recovery. Abandonment issues. Those are a big one. Codependency. That's a big one. Low self-esteem. Another big one. They use psychodynamics, or the way people function psychologically, to promote change and healing and rely on the here and now interactions of members. So we really want to look at how people are interacting, and if they're cutting each other off and snipping at each other, we want to take a look at that. If they are being overly solicitous of somebody, we want to take a look at that. Why do they need that person's approval? Interpersonal process group leadership focuses on the present, noticing signs of people recreating their past in what's going on between and among members of the group. We tend to create or recreate that microcosm that we grew up in. Group leaders monitor how group members relate to one another, how each member is functioning psychologically or emotionally, and how the group is functioning as a whole. Techniques really vary depending on the type of process group and the developmental stage of the group. If you're in that forming stage, you're going to do much different activities than if you are in the norming stage. 
They're based on the needs of group members and the needs of the group as a whole. Sometimes it may be more psychoeducational. Sometimes it may be more interpersonal and expressive. And they require a high degree of understanding about and insight into group dynamics and individual behavior. The three specialized groups include relapse prevention, communal and culturally specific groups, and expressive groups such as art therapy, dance, and psychodrama. <coughs> relapse prevention groups provide clients with skills to identify and manage high-risk situations. Again, from a co-occurring perspective, this means high risk for use or addiction and high risk to create depression, anxiety, or trigger a bipolar or psychotic episode. Relapse prevention groups stabilize clients' lifestyles through changes in behavior, focus on problem solving and skills building in order to increase clients' feelings of self-control. These groups explore the problems of daily life and recovery. So we're going to look at what happens in your day-to-day -day life. What are your stressors? What are your vulnerabilities? If you've done anything with dialectical behavior therapy, you're familiar with the term vulnerabilities. These are things that make us more vulnerable to reacting badly or choosing poor coping skills, such as being overtired, overhungry, overcommitted, rushed. Relapse prevention group leaders monitor client participation for risk of relapse. If they start talking stinking thinking, if they start romanticizing the past, we look for signs of stress and we identify if there's a need for a particular intervention, such as detox, medication management, individual counseling, crisis intervention, etc. Relapse group leaders can help a group work through a member's relapse. When a member relapses, the best practice says that person should not come back until they are clean and sober. Yeah, they need to detox. They can't come in reeking of alcohol or being high on opiates. But during that period when the person is gone, the group needs to grieve, for lack of a better word. They need to deal with their anger. They need to deal with their frustration. They need to deal with their fear that it could happen to them. These leaders need to understand the range of consequences clients face because of relapse. And again, this is the client who relapses him or herself, legal, work-related, interpersonal, personal, but also the group. How does a relapse impact the group? These relapse prevention groups draw on techniques used in all other groups. So again, the group leader needs to understand what techniques are available and how to most effectively use them. Communal and culturally specific groups build personal relationships with clients before turning to treatment tasks. One of the groups that I was able to facilitate for a while um, was a group for mothers who had had a miscarriage or who had delivered a baby who was stillborn. These women had a chance to build personal relationships before we moved to the treatment task of grieving and acceptance and what that meant to them, etc. They can be integrated into a therapeutic group and they show a respect for a culture and its healing practices. You may have a group of people from um, a certain place, of a certain ethnicity, of a certain religion. You may consider allowing them to draw upon their personal strengths, their cultural strengths and healing practices and share those with the larger group. Leaders strive to be culturally competent, avoid stereotypes, and allow clients to self-identify. They're aware of their own cultural attitudes as well as the cultural attitudes of their organization and the other people in the group. I worked with a man at one point in a place in Florida, very, very rural, very, very white. And I was working with a man who self-identified as African-American, and he wouldn't go to 12-step groups. 
And being a very, very new counselor, I asked him why. And he said, I'm the only black man who'd be in there and I don't feel safe. And I said, oh, that makes sense to me. So we started looking at things like in the rooms, online meetings, churches that might be able to support his recovery. So it's very important to be aware of the community, the people in the group, as well as the cultural attitudes and identification of the client himself or herself. Expressive groups foster social interaction as group members engage in a creative activity. This can be creating a mural, creating a drama. It can be a whole variety of things. It can be physical activity even. It helps clients explore their substance abuse and mental health issues, its origins, the effect it had on their lives, and new options for coping. One of the activities our art therapist used to do is they had a before and after collage. They would take a piece of poster board, divide it down the center. One side would be their addicted self, and the other side would be what they hoped to be in recovery or what they knew they could be. The expressive groups really depend on the form of the expression clients are asked to use. The group is going to be very different if you're working on collages versus doing psychodrama. The leaders, however, need to be trained in the specific modality being used. He or she needs to be able to recognize signs related to the histories of trauma and help clients find resources they need to work through powerful emotions. In a trauma-informed care situation, we need to be very, very cognizant of not recreating a situation that reminds a survivor of a ritualistic abuse situation. Expressive group leaders are also sensitive to a client's ability and willingness to participate in the activity. Some clients are not going to feel comfortable with the empty chair technique. Some clients are not going to feel comfortable with psychodrama. Some clients are going to feel inhibited if you're asking them to actually draw. One of the things that I've found is if you offer people the uh, option to make collages, cut pictures out of magazines, um, or print things off the internet, cut them out and put them on the, as a collage, those who have little or no artistic ability like myself tend to be much more expressive and much more engaged in the activity than if we're trying to draw something and we never made it past stick figures. In summary, there are multiple types of groups that are available to assist clients in achieving their goals. We need to view their current coping skills as creative adaptations that help them survive until now. What they did got the job done. It helped them survive until now. But we want them to do more than survive. We want them to thrive. We want to strengthen the healthy skills. And we want to understand that the skills required to facilitate these groups overlap significantly. So you're not precluded from dabbling in different types of groups if you get a little bit of training. Once you have the foundational group knowledge, which you will have when you finish going through all of the chapters in this series. So just to sum it up, to remember, types of groups, psychoeducational, skills development, cognitive behavioral, support groups, relapse prevention, communal and culturally specific, and expressive. Remember, in order to make a group effective, you want to start the group by telling people what they're going to learn or do and why it is useful to them. Present an overview of what you're going to talk about. Have written material available for those people who prefer to read or who are visual learners. Discuss the material and apply it after you present it. And then have each group member close by identifying one thing they got out of the group or one way they foresee themselves using that tool in the next week. CEUs for this presentation, as well as the training curriculum to become an addictions counselor, can be found at allceus.com. If you are seeking treatment for someone, 
visit allceus.com slash treatment resources or find treatment.samsa.gov.